All, this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So Yersinia pestis is the pathogen that can cause bubonic plague. In the U.S., in the Western states, about seven cases per year are reported of bubonic plague. And you might think that plague here and no <laughs> outcry about it. The reason is that we have antibiotics that can very easily handle this pathogen now. Although this pathogen could be modified to resist antibiotics, plus because it can be transmitted through the aerosol, which we saw with the COVID, it can be weaponized. So I'm not gonna to discuss too much about that, that how can it be weaponized, but it can be weaponized. Because of that, this has a double the scare of it. But anyways, the latest, today's discussion, there is a case of plague that was reported in Oregon. The person was in the initial stages of it. So they treated them early and, and all the contacts. Their cat was the one that was sick and they got it from the cat. Cat did not survive, but the human have survived and they are okay. So this is the basic summary of it. I'm gonna discuss the Yersinia pestis as well and how does it cause, it has some very tricky things that it do to our innate immune system. I wanna discuss that with you. So let's start. So first of all, this is drbean.com. If you would like to have more lectures, medical lectures, you can get access to it on drbean.com. Very interesting thing for me is that we've been working on pain management nowadays. And so if you see here in the pain management and opioid use disorder, which is a requirement for CME for, by the Drug Enforcement Agency, that is the course that we are working on nowadays. This course alone on the other sites is two, three hundred dollars. And you get this all for very, very less price. Then very quickly, this is the history.com. Again, I'm not going to get into was it bio warfare that we ended up in the US with the plague or was it something else? According to history, it was brought into US. First patient was March of 1900. The patient's name was Wang Chut King, who died of this uh, disease. And the thought is that this disease came to US through ships, which may have rodents, where the plague was from the Asian regions. Then in the US plague, if you see here, these are the states. This is nps.gov. And these are the states where plague uh, cases have been reported. So mostly on the Western side. This is CDC with the plague and I'll just have the link in there. I'm gonna just quickly go through the links so you know where the references are. This is WHO, this is bubonic plague. Bubonic plague, actually the, the word, Greek word, bubos means groin. So in this disease, the lymph nodes swell up mostly in the groin area, but can be also in the armpit and the neck or cervical regions as well. These lymph nodes, they, they swell up, they become red, then they become black, then they rupture and the pus and the pathogen come out of it. This is why it used to be called black death as well. History's largest pandemics were because of this pathogen, especially in the middle of the 1300, uh, 1300s or 1346. So bubonic plague, that's the case that we saw. Then these are other references for plague related um, studies and plague related pathologies, etc. And now we're gonna talk about it with my drawings. So <clears throat> for the healthcare, students and professionals, why did I draw a plague like this? It is a, it is a gram negative rod. It is a coccobacillus. So that means it could be in spherical shape or in 
rod like shape but if you see here it looks like a hairpin the reason for that is that when you stain it its central portion picks up less stain and the polar ends or the ends of it they pick up more stain so under the microscope it looks like a hair pin that is why it is called a bipolar staining pathogen now this particular case bubonic plague usually bubonic plague so there are three kinds of plagues or diseases from your senior pestis bubonic plague where the lymph nodes swell up there can be a plague which is disseminated in the blood vascular system and can affect other organs especially the arms and feet and and the skin area which can become black and necrosed and then there is um pneumonia as well there is pulmonary plague as well the incubation time is 2 to 8 days the first symptoms are usually fever can be anywhere from 101 to 105 degree headaches chills and weakness one or more swollen and painful lymph nodes so sudden headache sudden fever with swollen lymph nodes is an important clue and if a person has already been uh, in contact with animals or rodents especially sick animals or animals that may have wounds or animals that may have fleas on them this pathogen actually lives in fleas as well we'll talk about that or if a person is bitten by a flea and then develops high grade fever with fever uh, with chills etc nausea vomiting this may be an important thing to consider now in this particular case there was nothing to worry about they caught it early on they have already managed the patient and the patient has survived now treatment of course when you look at the other news about plague they would not talk about treatment and we are a medical uh, channel so we'll talk about treatment as well for healthcare professionals the this treatment uh, the reference is current medical diagnosis 2022 so as soon as you suspect that somebody may have plague you immediately start the management even before you get the diagnosis or labs what do you do the duration of the treatment is going to be for 10 days i <clears throat> the most experience with the antibiotic is streptomycin so intravenous streptomycin 1 g every 12 hours for 10 days that is the drug that is used most often so this is the drug of choice alternatively or we can give intravenous gentamicin 2 mg per kg loading dose and then 1.7 mg per kg every 8 hours for 10 days you can also give oral or iv doxycycline 100 mg daily for 10 days so that is the treatment if the person has pulmonary plague then they have to be in the pulmonary isolation unit because this pathogen can can be conveyed or transmitted to other people through aerosol so when the patient would cough or laugh or talk they can actually transmit the pathogen in their breath through their breath to the other people now just very quickly there have been three pandemics by this pathogen in the early times uh, 1300 and then 1400 and then 1600 but they it became pandemic in those times because there were no antibiotics nowadays we have antibiotics that is why 6 7 cases per year occur in the us and we still catch them and manage them so here this is a very good diagram from research gate the thing that is interesting here is that if you go this is the first time the plague occurred and i'll go to the time and dates in a second and if you see here it went from african countries to egypt and then from there it went outwards that was the first time when it arrived in europe somewhere in 1346 i think it killed about 25 million people in europe and another 25 million ish in the rest of the world as well it had taken out 
so there are all kinds of stats. Some people say half of Europe's population, some say 70%. I have read that more authentic is about 40% of the population was killed as a result of the bubonic plague arriving in the um, in Europe. Then the second time that it occurred, it started in Asia, and then from there it it spread to Crimea, and from Crimea then it sp spread to other countries, including Europe. The third time it started was from China, and from there it went to the other countries, including almost the rest of the world. Now, the first time when plague occurred with Yersinia pestis, there was, so that was 1346, that 5,000 to 10,000 deaths were occurring on daily basis. You may have seen with the COVID as well, there was time with this many deaths. So 5,000 to 10,000 deaths on daily basis just in the Constantinople city. Then <clears throat> the Black Death, it almost killed 25 million people, and then, as I said, 25 million more in the rest of the world. Then 1665 to 1666, there was another outbreak in London area and then spread. The, there were 7,000 people who were dying weekly just in London. So there have been pandemics because of your senior pestis in the past. Now, a few properties of this pathogen that are really interesting. Number one, it is a coccobacillus, so it can be kind of in a spherical shape or rod shape. Bacillus is rod, coccus is spherical. It is gram negative. It stains bipolar, as I said before, with the right Giemza and Wesen or methylene blue stains. And it stains more heavily on its ends and less heavily, or it, it's mostly clear in the middle central area because of that it looks like a hairpin under a microscope now interesting thing it has many many interesting plasmids and genes that it uses to do its function but some interesting one are the following number one it has lipopolysaccharides it's a gram negative pathogen it has lipopolysaccharide that can act as an endotoxin and when it is released that causes um immunogenicity and causes damage. Then it has a type three secretion system. That means it has tiny needle-like spikes on it with which it can get near a host cell, a tissue cell, and then inject its toxins through this needle into the cell. Just like we can get a needle that gives us an injection, this pathogen has tiny micro microscopic needles that it punctures the nearby cells and injects toxins in them, especially the, the V antigen that it injects in them. V antigen in turn is toxic to the cells and kills them. It also has a little protein on its surface which inhibits complement system. So when our immune system becomes activated against it and we have the complement activation, it can actually inhibit complement activation and kind of suppress the immune system from becoming active. Then it has another antigenic um, product or protein on it, which we say W protein. That W protein actually is stuck on its surface. It is not secreted from it, but it is said that this W protein helps this pathogen um, evade macrophages and phagocytosis. And I will tell you the story of how it be works with macrophages a little later, but just know that it has a lot of uh, power tools on its discretion to fail the immune system to evade the immune system, to even replicate within the macrophages and to cause damage to the cells. The capsule, it has a capsule as well, which is made up of, which has F1 proteins too, and that is also immunogenic or antigenic. Now, humans are not actually its primary host. The primary hosts are rodents and animals. It lives in them. 
and then it actually causes plague within the animals but the thing is it it lives in so many animals that even if some animals die the others still carry it plus they say that the intensity of plague within the animals is lower so it doesn't just wipe out all of them as it did with humans in the past and so because of that there is an under current of plague that is living in animals all the time especially as i said western states of the us so in the rural area of the us this plague outbreak or not outbreak a few cases occur every year rock squirrels wood rats ground squirrels prairie dogs chipmunks mice voles and rabbits can be affected and as you can tell the cats as well now <clears throat> now we're getting to a very fascinating area that okay how does it really live in these pathogens it actually lives on the pathogens in fleas so then the second question is how does it live in fleas and then the third question is how does it enter humans or other animals it can actually enter the blood supply of the animals as well or the blood system or tissues and kill them but it generally actually lives in the fleas and that is how it just kind of rides on these animals so let's look at how fleas actually transmit that so flea bites transmit that and i'll i'll discuss how it does it contaminated fluids so for example you have a wounded animal or sick animal and that has contamination from your senia pestis and you have touched that contaminated fluid and you may have an injury from where it can enter or uh, the tissue which may be damaged or infected and you touch that similarly as i said before infectious droplets it can also be present in the respiratory system and from there it can come out in droplets bubonic plague especially with the flea bites so now how does it do how does it reach us or other animals <coughs> excuse me so check this out let's say this is a flea so this was a flea like this <laughs> right this was the flea there were some legs over here and that right so this was flea this is the mouth of the flea and this is the esophagus this is a special structure in the fleas that is called proventriculus then this is the stomach of the flea then here are some little branches off of the git system and then this is the fecal matter and this is the anus this is the flea's digestive system yersinia pestis lives in the in the proventriculus of the flea and it kind of clogs up that area it works with the coagulase enzyme and it just clogs this up when it clogs it up and flea is trying to drink blood that blood doesn't reach the stomach because it is clogged up here where the esophagus is meeting the stomach and flea becomes very hungry because it is not getting any nutrition so guess what it does it becomes all frustrated hungry and it starts biting more and more of the things around it of course what are the things around this these are the animals or humans so when it bites them it brings in the blood trying to drink it that blood comes in but there is this stop over here so when blood comes in the pathogen dislodges over here this whole thing becomes swollen because of the blood coming in which is not getting into the stomach when it becomes swollen the pathogen that is sitting in this um, proventriculus it kind of dislodges some pathogens dislodge and they become blood borne here then as this area was engorged and when it relaxes the blood actually regurgitates back towards the animal from where it is sucked out, out and that pathogen then travels out as well with the blood and goes into the animal so it is like waves of blood come in and then they carry the pathogen back into the animal that is how it uses flea in this very strange interesting way to get into the animals or humans 
Now, once it is inside our tissues, let's say it has bitten us somewhere. Interestingly, it has a very interesting behavior with the innate arm. Innate arm system is the first set of cells, correct? So polymorphonuclear cells or the mon uh, neutrophils, and by the way, these diagrams are for my immunology book that I'm almost finished with. So this is a neutrophil. And if you see here, the neutrophils have special operators in them that they use to break down the pathogens. Neutrophils or polymorphonuclear cells, they can actually pick up this pathogen, the Yersinia pestis, and destroy it. So they're very good at destroying it. On the other hand, macrophages are not so lucky. This pathogen has actually developed special powers or acquired special powers to not only interact with macrophages and enter them, it has special proteins on its surface that use, it uses to cling to macroph macrophages and enter them. Not only it does that, it can actually release toxins for macrophages, which cause the macrophages microtubular skeleton, just like we have skeleton, like bones. Imagine the cells have a cytoskeleton as well it can disable their cytoskeleton. It is just like somebody gives us some poison and we become disabled. It disables the microtubular skeleton of a macrophage. So macrophage cannot move and operate. So macrophage cannot do phagocytosis. Macrophage cannot eat the pathogen to destroy it. So it paralyzes the macrophages. And so then it enters the macrophage. On the other hand, it enters in them and then mul multiplies. If a macrophage has actually eaten it, phagocytosed it, and is trying to destroy it, this pathogen has trick up its sleeve in that case as well. So what it does is it enters there and creates a protein protection around it. And the lysosomal enzymes, the digestive enzymes of the macrophage cannot destroy it. Then it sits in there and replicates and increases in numbers. Then it has special proteins that allow it to escape the macrophage as well. So it actually uses macrophage as its home. It can break through the macrophage. It can disable the macrophage. So macrophage cannot do anything to it. It can then enter the macrophage, replicate, then come out of it. If macrophage has eaten it, phagocytosed it, it can actually disable the lysosomal activity by creating a protective shell around this and then replicate and grow in there, then come out of the macrophage. It can suppress the immune system. Not only that, as you saw before, it can suppress the complement activation as well. So this is a behavior it does. An important thing to note here is the bubonic pl plague means that the local lymph nodes become swollen. So it was thought in the past that what happens is that the macrophages, so let's say this is a lymph node here, and this is a tissue where this pathogen is present here, it was thought that the macrophages here would eat up this pathogen, then they would run to the lymph node and bring the pathogen here. But now it is known that it is not necessary that macrophages have to do this, although they can. It is also, uh, what happens is that local release of the pathogen in the tissue from the macrophages make the pathogen born into the lymphatic tissue and travel or swim through the lymphatics to the local lymph nodes. In the local lymph nodes, it starts killing the cells by activating their programmed death molecules, which causes a local reaction, immune reaction. Remember, this is the immune, <laughs> immune spaceship. The lymph node has B cells and T cells and natural killer cells and has follicular dendritic cells. It is filled with army. And so when you attack this army hub, there is an intense reaction over here, which causes the, the lymph node to swell up. Now, because this pathogen is sitting there and killing the cells slowly, this lymph node would then become first red and pain, painful and swollen. Then it would become black in color because there is tissue that is dying now and the cells that are dying. Then the overlying skin would start dying as well and become black. Then it would rupture and the pus and the pathogen and the broken tissue would come out of it. This is why it used to be called Black Death when there would be infection by this. So this is the discussion 
for today. There was one case in Oregon has been treated, cat died, the pathogen is Yersinia pestis. It is present in the Western states of the US. It was brought here, or the first case was in 1900 March. And uh, since then it has been here with six, seven cases per year. We are able to handle this pathogen and this plague doesn't become widespread endemic or pan, sorry, it is kind of endemic in the animals. It doesn't become an outbreak because the antibiotics can work on it. If the patient is in the early stages, patient becomes cured. However, if the disease has spread in the blood, sepsis has occurred, or if it has gone to lungs, then it is, I think sepsis is 50% fatal and lung infection is 100% fatal. So that is the discussion. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Uh, like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to get access to Dr. Bean, there is a link in the description. If you would like to support this work, there are more links in the description as well. And I would see you next week. Bye for now.